Good evening. Open your Bibles tonight, if you will, to the book of Romans. Uh, we're in Romans, the 14th chapter. And uh, we're going to begin looking at verse 1. I want to review uh, where we left off last week. Uh, our Bible study, we're talking about the principles here in Romans uh, that help us to do what is right. I believe God gave us his word to teach us how to live. Uh, he also gave us his word primarily to teach us how to be saved. Most important thing in your life tonight is that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God loves you. Christ died for you on the old rugged cross. He shed his precious blood to pay the debt of your sins. And there is salvation for everyone who will turn from their sin and turn to Christ. We repent and we believe. Uh, and salvation is the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a wonderful gift it is. I have, in the years of my lifetime, received a number of gifts that are precious to me. But there's no gift that I've ever received more precious than that gift of eternal life. I know that my soul is saved. I know that my sins are forgiven. I know that my name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. I know that I have a home prepared for me in God's heaven. And that's a blessing. The Bible shows us how to be saved. And the Bible also teaches us how to live. And, and Romans chapter 14 is a chapter that I hope that you'll learn some things that will guide you in your Christian life and your living. We make decisions every day. And I know we all want to make right decisions. We want guidance in our lives to be able to do the right thing. And God gives that to us here in Romans chapter 14. I'm going to review what we went over last Wednesday night, the first of the principles, and then we're going to look at the other four principles tonight. Begin reading with me in verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. The point of that verse is, as a child of God, you are God's servant. And as a child of God, I'm God's servant. And I will not answer to you for the decisions I make, and you will not answer to me. You will answer to the master. And who is the master? The Lord God. I will answer to the master, the Lord God. Verse 5, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Uh, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. In these verses, Paul uses two examples. The example of what a person eats and the example of what days a person thinks are important. Remember the Jews had the law and the Jewish law taught them about certain animals that were unclean. And these animals were not to be eaten by the Jews. Uh, the other thing that I think is in play here, in the city of Rome, the meat that was sold in the markets was meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And Jewish Christians, Jewish believers, people who had grown up in the Jewish faith, they were not going to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols, so they ate vegetables instead. Some ate meat, some ate only vegetables, some felt the Sabbath day was 
still a sacred day to them. And uh, the feast days of the Jews, they wanted all of those to be observed. What we discovered last Wednesday night is the believer who has understood his liberty in Christ is subject to being despised by the weaker brother. Now let me ask you tonight, is there a difference between Saturday and Friday? Or Saturday and Thursday, or Saturday and Wednesday, or Saturday and Tuesday, or Saturday and Monday. Monday. The obvious answer, I think, for you and me as a child of God is no. Every day is important. Our day of worship is not the Sabbath day. The only one of the Ten Commandments not repeated in the New Testament is the commandment, Thou shalt do what? Honor the Sabbath day, keep it holy. That is not found in the New Testament. Our day of worship is the first day of the week, the day that Christ rose again. That's our day of worship. And we honor the Lord on what I like to call the Lord's day, the first day of the week. That's the day we have set aside to worship. But we don't see the Sabbath, a Saturday, as being uh, a day as the Jewish people did as believers in Christ. Uh, when it comes to the matter of what you eat, the Bible says if you can give thanks to God eating. I don't believe there is any unclean animal that you are forbidden to eat. I think all of us are glad tonight we can eat sausage and we can eat bacon. And we can eat ham and we can eat pork chop. I thought I'd get amen out of that. <laughs> I like all of those things. And when I stand before God, I, I have a liberty in Christ to be able to eat those things. I, I'm not under law. I'm under grace. Amen. Now, the issue was the weak believers who were still trying to abide by all those Jewish laws. They were very critical of believers who didn't feel the need to abide by those things. You would be need to be careful. I am very aware of what I think and what I do, what I say. I pray every day, God, help me to do right. Help me to think right. Help me to speak right. Help me to act right. When I don't, the Holy Spirit of God convicts me and I confess that to him as a sin before him. That's what you and I do. We, we ought to be looking at our life and we ought to be comparing our life to the word of God and making sure that we're doing right and living right before God. I'm not supposed to try to be the one to judge your life. Um, Is that clear enough? Sometimes people get the attitude, well, because I do this and you don't, I'm more spiritual than you. Let me tell you the thing that I believe. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all come to God the same way. We repent of our sin. We humble ourselves before God. And God, by his grace, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, forgives us. We all come to God the same way. The ground's level at the foot of the cross. You and me need to be, uh, what's the word we learned last week? Uh, the principle of consideration is, is so important. You belong to the Lord, I belong to the Lord. You serve the Lord. The Lord will be your judge, he will be my judge. All right. Uh, Let's don't be critical of one another. I've grown in the faith a lot over the 57 years I've been a Christian. I still have some growing to do. But thank God, he's still working on me. I want to be more like Christ every day. Now, I can truthfully tell you tonight, I'm more like Jesus today than I was 57 years ago. But I'm not as much like Jesus as I want to be 
It's a daily walk, the Christian life. Seeking the Lord, walking with the Lord, trusting in the Lord. So let's not be critical of one another. Let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's reach out a hand to help one another. God's people ought not be a judgmental people. We ought to be a blessing. Um, I read about a very conscientious wife. She tried very hard to please her husband. And that was no easy task because he was a very, very critical person. He always seemed the most cantankerous in the morning at breakfast. And no matter how hard she tried, she could never please him. If the eggs were scrambled, he wanted them poached. And if the eggs were poached, he wanted them scrambled. Well, one morning, with what she thought was a stroke of genius, the wife poached one egg and scrambled the other egg. And she thought to herself as she placed a plate in front of her husband, I'm certain that he will be happy with his breakfast this morning. And anxiously she awaited what surely this time she thought would be his unqualified approval. But he looked down at the plate, he snored it, and he said, can't you do anything right, woman? You've scrambled the wrong egg. <laughs> now more often than not, our criticism of others is, is just about like that. There's no need for it and there's no place for it. God's command to us is clear. We're not to judge. We're not to criticize one another. A Christian should practice the principle of consideration. All right, that's the review from last week. Let's look at verses six through nine and talk about the second principle, the principle of motive. Look at verse six. The apostle Paul continues the thought by saying, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. What was he talking about? Well, if you observe the Sabbath day and you observe it to the Lord, that's between you and the Lord. If you observe the feast day and you observe it to the Lord, that's between you and the Lord. A person can do that if they choose to. All right. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe. He who eats, eats to the Lord. For he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Do you see what the scripture said? If it bothers you to eat the meat, then don't eat it. Give thanks for the butter beans and the corn and uh, the broccoli. And you say, that's hard to do, preacher. I have a little granddaughter. She's not so little anymore. She turned 14 in January. And she's a blessing. Uh, we saw a message, uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday. Uh, Jonathan has seen it, sent a picture and said, Hallie is doing FCA in her school today. She was the one doing the program. Man, what a blessing that is. She's on the swim team and She's a very active part of the, the FCA. She's very healthy. When she was a little girl, her favorite food was broccoli. No joke. Broccoli was her favorite food. She called it trees. I mean, she's like two years old, three years old. And uh, we went to a restaurant one time with them. I don't remember what restaurant it was. I think it was in Commerce. But anyway, we sat down at the table and, and they were given the order and, and she got the child's plate and, and they, you know, a vegetable came with it. And they said, what vegetable do you want? She said, broccoli. And the, the waitress said, she won't eat that broccoli. And her mom and her daddy said, you just watch. She ate every bit of it. She loves broccoli. And uh, 
Give thanks and eat it. If it bothers you to eat the meat, don't eat the meat. Give thanks for the vegetables and eat it. Uh, it, it. Is there a sin in eating that meat? No, they sacrificed to idols. No. Give thanks to God and eat it. Look what it says in verse 7. None of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. That's the answer to the people who say, well, it doesn't matter what I do because it doesn't hurt anybody but me. How many of you have heard that? I've heard that. That's not true. The decision I make affects the people that I love. The decisions you make affect the people that you love. None of us lives to himself. No one dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord. I belong to the Lord. You belong to the Lord. I'm a child of God. You're a child of God. Verse 9 says, For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Jesus Christ has set us free. We're saved by grace through faith. Jesus Christ has set us free. And we ought to live in that freedom in Christ. Walk in that victory in Christ. Let me ask you a question tonight. You can decide your motive in life by asking this question. Who are you trying to please? That's how you determine what your motive is in life. Who are you trying to please? That's one of the key questions of life. Are you trying to please yourself? Are you trying to please others? Or are you trying to please the Lord? I'm going to give you a clue. It's hard to please yourself. I'm one of those people, I guess, my mother always told me, Paul, you're a perfectionist. you got to get it perfect. Well, I try to. And I'm frustrated if I don't. Do you understand where I'm coming from? I rarely have ever done anything in my life that I was pleased with. All right? That's not the answer, trying to please yourself. What about trying to please other people? How does that work out for you? It doesn't work out too good for me. It's hard to please other people. It's just like the dear lady in the breakfast. I mean, some people, you just can't please them. So what should you try to do? Please the Lord. Please the Lord. What you do, do it for the Lord. Do it because you love the Lord. That's the motive. Loving the Lord. That's why you do what you do. That's why I come to church. That's why I pray. That's why I witness. That's why I preach. That's why I sing. I love the Lord. And I'm going to do it as long as God gives me the breath to do it. All right? Years ago, a Christian ministry established an orphanage and a hospital in a very needy part of the city of Calcutta in India. There were many orphan children who found a home there. And these children experienced love and security for the first time in their lives. Many of these young folks were touched by the love of Jesus Christ through those missionaries. And many of them would surrender their hearts and lives to Jesus. I hope you understand tonight the only way that people will ever believe that Jesus loves them is if you love them. How are they going to believe Jesus loves them if we don't love them? Now, the same thing was happening at the hospital. Christian doctors and nurses cared for the physical needs of patients, and many of those patients were touched by the love of Jesus. And the work of these ministries soon led to the establishment of a gospel-preaching, Bible-preaching church. Well, as you probably know, the predominant religion of India is Hinduism. And the Hindu leaders were not at all happy about the impact that these Christian ministries were having in their city. 
One of those Hindu leaders took one of the Christian converts to the side and began to question him. He said to him, we have orphanages and we have hospitals. What brought you to the Christian? And the Christian convert thought, thoughtfully replied, he said, yes, you do have orphanages and hospitals, but the Christian orphanages and the Christian hospitals are different. You Hindus are working for something, but the Christians, they're working for somebody. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ who makes all the difference, amen? That is what makes the difference. What was said about those Christian missionaries ought to be said about you and it ought to be said about me. We are doing what we do for somebody. We do what we do for Jesus. The second principle that you need to consider when you make a decision is that principle of motive. A Christian does Whatever pleases the Lord. Why? Because we love the Lord. All right, let's look at the third principle. And there is the principle of accountability. Look at verses 10 through 12. But why do you judge your brother? Do you see this thing? That it's, it's all the way through this chapter. Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So that each of us shall give account of himself to God. What's the third principle there? Accountability. The first principle is consideration. The second principle is motive. The third principle here is accountability. How does that work, preacher? It works like this. When I get to heaven, I will not give account of myself to you. And when you get to heaven, you will not give account of yourself to me. Listen to how Paul puts it. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Accountability. Anybody here tonight remember Buddy Epson? Buddy Epson was on TV back when TV used to be good. You remember when comedies were funny? All the comedies today are like tragedies. I, there's nothing funny anymore. Buddy Epson starred in the TV series, The Beverly Hillbillies. All right. Later, he was a private investigator on TV in the show Barnaby Jones. Buddy Epson. He's a well-known actor. Buddy Epson said he had a basic guideline for making decisions in his life. You know what it was? He said, I simply asked myself if my mother would approve, and if I don't think that my mother would approve, I don't do it. Well, that in itself, that's pretty good advice. A man named Carl Sewell was a pioneer in the early days of the automobile industry. And he said when trying to determine a standard of behavior for his employees at his automobile plant, he finally came up with this guideline. He told the people that worked for him they should always ask themselves this question. How would my actions appear if they were described tomorrow on the front page of the news? That's also, I think, a pretty good way to evaluate your choices and your decisions. But the scriptures tonight we've read, they moved beyond Buddy Epson's advice. You know, I have to explain my actions to mom. They moved beyond Carl Sewell's advice. I, I have to explain my actions to my peers. What does the scripture we read tonight teach us? It reminds us that the judgment seat of Christ each of us will have to explain our actions to God. Amen. The principle of accountability. In every choice, in every decision you make, pray, read the scriptures, 
Seek God's face. Ask God to guide you, realizing that the choice you make, the decision you make, one day you will stand before God and you will be held to account. All right? The principle of accountability. Then you have the principle of motive and the principle of consideration. And I think we're going to finish. We're going to work our way uh, through. Look at verse 13 through 21, and you'll see the fourth principle tonight if you're writing these down. Uh, I call it the principle of love. And I want you to see how it starts. You see this theme all the way through Romans chapter 14. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. Same thing. How many times have we seen that? Why does the Holy Spirit repeat it? I think because we need to hear it. He says, resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy the food for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify Another. What does the word edify mean? Build up. All right. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. If you read this whole chapter, the principle of love runs like a thread through the entire passage. The summary of the principles, verse, uh, verse 13, you and me should make up our mind that we will not put a stumbling block or an obstacle in a brother's or a sister's way. God help us. Jesus reminded it, uh, this uh, of this principle. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Jesus said, to whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. God help me not to be a stumbling block to my brother and to my sister. Now the apostle Paul he echoed the same truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Listen to these words. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I'm not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jew Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news, the gospel, and is shared in its blessings. Do you see the principle there? There's only one principle that outweighs the principle of freedom in the Christian life, and it's the principle of love. Paul is not suggesting here an obsession that paralyzes us because we are so afraid of what others will think about what we do. Instead, 
Paul is giving us a simple reminder that the cause of our relationship with others, what we do affects others. And because of our responsibility to others, we need to do the things that will build them up instead of tearing them down. Paul said, be careful. Don't use your freedom as a means of causing your brother to stumble. How does that work? Works like this. If I know that you are sensitive in the area of eating meat sacrificed to idols, I'm not going to do that right in front of your face. No, because I love you. If I know that the feast days, the Sabbath days are important to you, I'm not going to find fault and criticize you for observing those things. Uh, Paul says you don't have to do it. Nothing requires you to do it. But if you choose to do it as honor the Lord, then do it. Those people who have the liberty in Christ that don't have to follow those requirements any longer, don't abuse the freedom that you have. I guess that's the word I need to, I need to use. Don't abuse the freedom that you have. Don't be a stumbling block. I'm going to tell you how I live. I live seeking to please the Lord. And then I live realizing that people look to me to be an example of following the Lord. And when I fail to follow the Lord as I should, I have sinned. And I need to do what the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I will tell you what I've learned about myself. I am as human as you. I am not perfect. I don't get it right all the time. And when I don't get it right, the Holy Spirit convicts me. And when the Holy Spirit convicts me, I confess it. And God forgives it. Amen. And so I can maintain that fellowship with the Lord. A Christian can live in sin and be the most miserable person in this world. No, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. If there's something in your life that's not pleasing to God, confess it. God will forgive it. God will restore your fellowship and you can walk in victory. Uh, God help us. We do have relationships with others and the choices that we make affect us. So let love guide you in the choice that you make. Uh, we have a responsibility to others. What we want to do as Christians is build one another up, edify one another in the Lord. We don't want to be a stumbling block to others. God help us, God forgive us. When we are, we want to be a blessing, not a stumbling block. Look at verses 22 and 23 and we're done tonight. You, you're going to see the principle of conscience. Verse 22 and 23. What does the Bible there say? I need to turn the page. Verse 22 says, Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. That's the principle of conscience. If a man eats meat with an uneasy conscience about it, you may be sure he is wrong to eat that meat. If God doesn't give you a piece, that it's all right, don't do it. Don't ever sin against the leading of the Holy Spirit or the working of God in your heart. Warren Wearsby, in his commentary, I like his commentaries, the Bible exposition commentaries are some of the best commentaries you can find. 
Uh, but he said about this verse, what it means is if it's doubtful, it's dirty. If you don't believe in your heart that it's right, don't do it. Someone defined the conscience as the thing that makes you tell your mother before your little sister does. And I think that might be a, one way of looking at it. Another commentary wrote about this verse said that the conscience is like the inner custodian for the child of God. The conscience is something within us that distinguishes between right and wrong and moves us toward that which is right. Now, a conscience can be trained. How is a conscience trained? For a child of God, your conscience will be trained by the word of God. I was blessed as a child to have a Christian mom and daddy. They taught me right from wrong. Now, I'm not gonna tell you I always did right, but I always knew right. They taught me the Ten Commandments. They taught me uh, the scriptures. And God used that to give me a conscience to help me to make good decisions. That's the blessing of growing up in a Christian home. It's a blessing to have a Christian mom and dad. Let me tell you the tragedy of today in America. We have a country today that has no conscience because they've never read the Bible they don't know the Ten Commandments. They don't know Christ as Lord and Savior. They don't have the Spirit of God in their heart and life to guide them and direct them. God help us. That's why our country's in the shape it's in. But understand tonight, conscience, the principle of conscience. If God doesn't give you a peace that it's all right, don't do it. Because if you do it without that peace of God to you, it's a sin. Do you see that? He, because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Clear enough, isn't it? Since we've been declared righteous before God, we need to act like righteous people. Uh, what are the guidelines we've looked at? Five of them, we considered the principle of consideration, the principle of motive, the principle of accountability, the principle of love, the principle of conscience. All of those things will guide us to do what is right. God help us to do what is right. Glad you joined us tonight for our study. I hope and pray that what we've shared with you from God's word will be a blessing and that it will be a means of helping you make good decisions, wise decisions in your life, and it will help you to do what is right. I want to invite you to join us for Sunday school. This Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, there's a Sunday school class for all ages. We've got a class for children, for youth. We've got a class for adults, for senior adults. There's a class for all ages. Come and join us as we study the scriptures together. Uh, worship service at 11 o'clock. Come join us as we worship the Lord our God, as God's people together. Uh, if you would uh, have a prayer request, if there's a burden uh, that I can be of help with, please, if you would, call me. Uh, my phone number, area code 803-942-1273. Send me a text message. I'd like to hear from you. If there's someone tonight listening and you don't know Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, I'd love to show you from the Bible how you can have a personal relationship with Christ. The greatest decision you can ever make in your life is to give your life to Christ. And I'd love to help you with that. Uh, call me, text me, uh, Paul Creason at 803-942-1273. Uh, well, may God bless you. And we will see you on Sunday morning.